guys. Uh, we met Paul and her yesterday and decided to not have any rehearsal and not be formal and be spontaneous. However... Also to go ahead. Sorry? Also to go ahead. Yeah. And so I'm not going to do that. And I won't introduce them yet. And uh, although, would you like me to introduce you? You have something new to say. <laughs> There's not much. This is a playwright who's had all the awards in the universe. All the Pulitzer Prizes, the Tony Awards, and this and that. And I don't need to introduce Monsieur Oster. He's also a big, big guy in our field. Very acclaimed. I don't need to be introduced to myself. I know myself. So, <laughs> okay. <laughs> What brings us three together tonight is, as you know, Beckett. <coughs> Beckett, his legacy, his influence on theater, literature, and as far as I'm concerned, my very lifelong close friendship with Mr. Beckett. More to the point, I would like to I would like to make a little notation that my late husband Dick Seaver is directly responsible for bringing the work of Samuel Beckett in English to America. And the, the word late is one of the great re regrets. Oh, bless you. Thank you. Dick was actually Mr. Olby's editor way back from the zoo story on. Um, when Dick was in Paris working on James Joyce, he discovered this Irish unknown Irish writer writing in French. He couldn't quite get that. He bought all the books, read them in French, and dropped a note to the French publisher with his wanting to meet the man and wanting to publish some of his work, if he could, in the literary review that he was running with two or three other poets and writers in Paris called Merlin. Um, he also had heard that there was a novel that had never been published in English called What? W-A-T-T. -T. In fact, had been rejected systematically throughout the entire English publishing industry. Beckett was very discouraged and had thrown the manuscript into a drawer, never to pull it out. But Dick pursued Beckett and persuaded him to show it to him. And I'd like to, if I can, one little paragraph of Dick's memoir where he had brought, he had taken his bike across Paris with a letter to Beckett, he didn't know him then, asking whether he could possibly have a chance to read the manuscript. He didn't hear for weeks, and he thought, okay, it's one of those things. So, a few weeks later, this is from Dick's book, there's a paragraph here, he said, we had all but given up hope of ever hearing from Beckett when one dark and stormy early evening in late November, as we were preparing spaghetti dinner, we do sabot, this is where Dick lived, where I lived, and knock on the door. The noise of the rain on the glass roof was so deafening, we barely heard the knock, when finally I answered, there, outlined in the light, was a tall, gaunt figure in a raincoat. Water streaming down from the brim of the nondescript hat placed on top of his head. He pulls up the manuscript from his raincoat and hands it to Dick. And he says, you asked me for this, thrusting the package into my hand. Here it is. At which point I realized that was what? And the man, the rain soaked silhouette, was Mr. Beckett himself. Thank you, I managed. You must be drenched. Won't you come in? Can't, he said. Must be off. Let me know what you think. And he disappeared into the night. And that night, the other writers and the, the staff of Merlin spent the entire night reading out loud, taking turns. And by morning, 
they decided to not publish that as a book. Now, they were just a magazine publisher, but decided we'll just find the money and do it. And they made an offer, and they had this thrill, a surprise, and he called Dick and his group, the Juveniles, the Merlin Juveniles, and it was published. Now, she called them the Merlin Juveniles, because they were goofy and Dick and all that. Um, Dick was so passionate with the discovery of Beckett's writing that it was really a literary explosion for him, and he wrote, he was asked to write an essay for Merlin about Beckett. Now, that essay made its way to America and in, in New York, the then new publisher of a new publishing house called Grove Press read the piece, flew to Paris to meet Dick, and hopefully to meet that Irish unknown writer. Well, the rest is history. Uh, Grove Press became Beckett's publisher, and Dick became the editor-in-chief of Grove Press, and became on this side of the Atlantic uh, Beckett's editor. Now, meanwhile, Beckett had asked Dick to translate three wonderful short stories called uh, Can yeah. The Calmatif, The End, and The Expelled, that were all published in Merlin as well. Uh, subsequent to that, Beckett asked Dick, would he translate Godot? And at that point, Dick was finishing his dissertation on Joyce, and had to decline, which of course he regretted for the rest of his life, in your mind. However, the world was well served having Beckett do his own writing and translating, though he hated translating his own work. Uh, I just, I won't be much longer, I just want to give one day, one day we were at the Dome Cafe, and at that time I was trying to publish a book, an anthology, an homage to Nelson Mandela, who was still incarcerated, and was gathering writing from various writers. And I was telling Sam about this, and he said, you have a piece of paper? I didn't. But I pulled out my final facts and on a little pink page on the floor, Sam wrote six lines of this wonderful little poem for me, really. It's a very uplifting poem, you'll see. Go end there one fine day, where never till then till as much as to say, no matter where, no matter when. Because we published it and it was subsequently published in the British edition. And I don't know, I will now turn, I remember you had said in the Paris Review, interview some time ago that you felt that Beckett was the one playwright you completely admired without restriction whatsoever. Do you have any more to say about that? Yes, because I'm a very selfish person. And I admire most the things that I get most from. Can you tell, perhaps tell us, at what point in your young, new playwright career they could enter your life and an influence or you feel that influence by osmosis? Well, nothing can come from osmosis unless you participate in it. So, yes, yes to a certain extent. I was aware of the first time I read a sentence by Beckett and the first time I, I saw or heard words by Beckett, that I was in the presence of somebody and some thing, not only a person, but a thing. It was absolutely extraordinary and amazing. I, I, I felt that uh, every once in a while you get to say that word, wow. Yeah, that's what I felt with my first experience with Beckett. Wow. My case is a bit different because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm two decades younger than Edward, and so... Um, rub it in, rub it in. <laughs> rub it in. When I, when I first encountered Beckett, he was already a known quantity. Uh, uh, I, I was very young, I was 19 or so, so we're talking about the mid-60s, but he was already a uh, world-famous writer. For me, interestingly, I didn't start with plays, but with these prose. 
and um, and this has happened to me with <coughs> several of the writers who later became my favorite writers. At first, it resisted me, or I resisted it. I was reading The Lone Dies, that was the first book I read, and I didn't quite get into the swing of it. And um, I put it down, I remember, and, and went back to it a few months later, and then I saw the light. And then I understood that this was prose on a level that one really encounters in any century. But uh, I think a great writer, I mean the really great ones, the truly original ones, are writing in a way so different from anybody else that um, it's so unexpected that it takes a while to absorb what they're doing. I mean, Emily Dickinson is a writer like this. Mm -hmm. she, she's so brilliant and so idiosyncratic. And unique, yeah. you, you need a little time to, to, to get into it. You know what Derrida, I was just writing down this sentence, De Derrida said, uh, Jacques Derrida said, Beckett's work make the limits of our language tremble. <laughs> Uh, so I should just say that I think one of the reasons why Edward and I are here together, I think, I'm not exactly sure, but one of the reasons is that in 2006, uh, on the event of Beckett's 100th birthday, I, I was the editor of um, a new collection of all his work at, with Grove Press. It's called the Grove Centenary Edition, and it's really pretty close to a complete Beckett in four volumes. And uh, uh, I cleaned up all the typos. If I did nothing else, uh, these, the, these versions are... Uh, what? what typos? <laughs> uh, um, and um, volume three was all the plays. And I was asking writers, different writers, to do prefaces. And I could think of no one, no one better to, to write about Beckett than Edward, and I contacted him. We knew, knew each other a little bit, um, and he gladly did it. And I, can you read it? Can you read those two pages? Yeah, I can, you do, that. I can do that. You want Good. me to? Yeah, I would yeah, love okay. to hear them again. Right. Yeah. I happen to have a copy with me. <laughs> <laughs> what was the context? The, the introduction to the Beckett uh, the, all his plays. This was your, yeah, the plays. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Uh, this is a book of, of um, the majority of Beckett's um, dramatic work that for some reason I was asked to write the uh, introduction to. For some reason, you wonder why. Well, come on. Maybe because I'd learned so much from him, I wouldn't let anybody else do it. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. And it's about this book. You have in front of you one of the most important books of the second half of the 20th century, the collected plays of Samuel Beckett. There are other writers of this period who matter, of course, Jorge Luis Borges, Vladimir Nabokov, not to make a list, but to name two. But Beckett is special in that he was equally a master in more than one field of literature drama, and the novel, in his case. I wish I could say I was as fond of, the, of his poetry as I am the rest of his work, but that's m my fault, perhaps, perhaps his, I don't know. Beckett's fault. <laughs> I will go so far as to say that Beckett reinvented both the novel and drama. Certainly his great trio of novels, Malloy, Malone Dies, and The Unnameable, are of a stylistic and thematic achievement far greater than the work of many of Beckett's more popular fellow Nobel Prize winners. Did the novel seriously end with these three pieces of Beckett's? Well, no, but avenues were certainly closed for other people, or to be generous, blockaded. <laughs> and what about the play as a form? Did Beckett close this down too? No, 
but he made it harder to take seriously most of what passes for drama these days. And he gave those of us who try to make serious theater a far harder task, forcing us to be pertinent and inventive in ways unlike those of the master than those of Beckett. For it's always the case that the greatest writers, while they teach and embolden us, are singular, and while their influence is profound, imitation of them is laughable. As an example, Harold Pinter and I have both learned much from Beckett. Clarity, simplicity, precision, The use of language as sound, as music, if you like. But if one can say of a piece of ours, oh, that's just like Beckett, then we have failed. An imitation of Beckett is folly. For he wrote Beckett better than anyone else did, <laughs> or could. I've directed Beckett's plays frequently. Happy Days, for example, Crap's Last Tape, Ohio Impromptu. And the experience has taught me so much about, about both directing and writing. Beckett heard and saw his plays on stage as he wrote them. And his stage directions need be followed precisely for the simple reason that they are exactly on target and approximation or departure from them leads to a lesser experience of the play. In general, the better the play, the least departure from the author's instructions is needed. In a lesser play, the directors and actors must be creative to compensate for the author's imprecisions. With Beckett, just assume that he knows what he's doing. <laughs> because he does. I'm always deeply puzzled when people say of Beckett, oh, he is so difficult, or so avant-garde, or complex, or ambiguous. It is the profoundest nonsense. For Beckett is perhaps the most naturalistic playwright I know of, as well as the clearest, and least obscure. The obscurity resides in the assumption of obscurity. I know that if Beckett's outdoor plays were set on suburban terraces and the indoor ones just inside those terraces in suburban living rooms, everyone would be happier. Certainly the less puzzled. We are most comfortable with the familiar. While there isn't a play in this collection you have in front of you that any sane playwright would not be proud to have written, we all have our favorites. To my taste, Beckett kept getting better as he wrote. And while waiting for Godot and Endgame, our head and shoulders above most late 20th century plays I find them ultimately as his least successful. Horrors, always mad for saying that. For his craft, Beckett's craft was not completely under control yet when he began writing. By Kraft's last tape and Happy Days, it was completely under control. And with the later short plays, he reached an essencing a reduction to that needed least to accomplish the most, which renders these relatively brief works fuller than some of the earlier, theoretically larger ones. Brahma is literature at its best, at any rate. When it is least, it is merely writing and exists as completely on the page 
as it does on the stage. To see and hear these plays as you read them. Read passages out loud for the music and the humanity of them. What a wonderful book you have with you. grace us with your input and reading of perhaps? Yes, well, we were talking about this uh, yesterday. Um, I did bring something I, I would like to read. Um, Beckett's journey as a novelist and a prose writer, fiction writer, I think in a way is different from his journey as a playwright because he started out very young writing fiction. Uh, and I don't think he wrote his first play until he was in his 40s. But um, uh, the early prose of Beckett is uh, very heavily influenced by Joyce. It's ornate, as who, as who wasn't? Yes, who wasn't? And they were, of course, so uh, fellow Irishmen, and they were friends. And yeah. Beckett uh, was uh, a, an admiring young younger writer who became deeply involved with Joyce, uh, which may explain his decision to write in French later, after World War II. Just getting out from under um, the familiar. Anyway, uh, the early Beckett prose is very different from what it would become later. Um, he wrote a, a, a book of stories, More Pricks Than Kicks, when he was, I think it was in his early 30s when that was published. And there's some terrific things in it, but it's not up to what he would later do. What, we talked about what. I think it's important to talk about how this book came into being. Beckett was living in France. It was World War II. He was part of an underground resistance group in Paris. His job was, I think, uh, carrying messages from one person to another. As he dismissively put it years later, you know, Boy Scout stuff. But it wasn't Boy Scout stuff. It was actually very dangerous. And when, um, when the cell was broken and his very best friend was arrested and later killed by the Nazis, Beckett and his wife, you know, the woman who had become his wife, had to leave Paris. They ran. They ran out of there. And uh, they made their way eventually down to the free zone in the south, in the town of Roussillon, where Beckett found work as an agricultural laborer. I mean, he was picking potatoes for two years. Um, and they had no money. And it was desperate, desperate wartime France. Uh, one of the most fascinating little anecdotes I've ever heard came to me from Wally Shawn, the, the playwright and actor, who told me that when he was acting in the film The Princess Bride, which maybe some of you have seen, a terrific children's movie, the big French actor there, Andre the Giant, a professional wrestler, had been a little boy growing up in Roussillon during the war. And Beckett befriended Andre the Giant before he became a giant and, <laughs> and, and drove him to school in the truck every, every morning. It's so moving to me. Anyway, Beckett said he wrote what as an exercise to keep his sanity. I think he mostly wrote it at night. It's a crazy book. It doesn't resemble any other novel I've ever read. And I also think it's one of the funniest books in the English language. So I want to read two passages from a long monologue delivered by one of the characters to Watt. When Watt arrives at the house of Mr. Knott to become a servant in said house, and this man who's talking to him is about to leave Mr. Knott's employ. So just, here's how the speech begins. I wish I had an Irish accent, but I can't do it. So bear with me. Ha, H-A-W, exclamation mark. Ha, how it all comes back to me, to be sure. That look, that weary, watchful vacancy. The man arrives, the dark ways all behind, all within, the long dark ways, in his head, in his side, in his hands and feet, and he sits in the red gloom, picking his nose, waiting for the dawn to break. <clears throat> the dawn, the sun, the light, ha! The long blue days for his head, for his side, 
and little paths for his feet, and all the brightness to touch and gather. Through the grass, the little moss, pa moss paths, <coughs> bony with old roots, and the trees sticking up, and the flowers sticking up, and the fruit hanging down, and the white exhausted butterflies, and the birds never the same, darting all day into hiding, and all the sounds meaning nothing. Then at night, rest in the quiet house. There are no roads, no streets anymore. You lie down by a window, opening out a refuge. Little sounds come that demand nothing, ordain nothing, explain nothing, propound nothing. And the short, necessary night is soon ended. And the sky blew again over all the secret places where nobody ever comes. The secret places never the same, but always simple and indifferent, always mere places sights of stirring beyond coming and going, the being so light and free that it is as the being of nothing. How I feel it all again after so long here and here and in my hands and in my eyes, like a face raised, a face offered, all trust and innocence and candor, all the soil and fear and weakness offered to be sponged away and forgiven. So after that rather poetic and serious beginning, several pages later, our man is really warming up. <coughs> he says, personally, of course, I regret everything. Not a word, not a deed, not a thought, not a need, not a grief, not a joy, not a girl, not a boy, not a doubt, not a trust, not a scorn, not a lust, not a hope, not a fear, not a smile, not a tear, not a name, not a face, no time, no place, that I do not regret exceedingly. <laughs> An ordure from beginning to end, and yet, when I sat for fellowship, but for the boil on my bottom, the rest, an ordure. The Tuesday scowls, the Wednesday growls, the Thursday curses, the Friday howls, the Saturday snores, the Sunday yawns, the Monday mourns, the Monday mourns. The wax, the moans, the cracks, the groans, the welts, the squeaks, the belts, the shrieks, the pricks, the prayers, the kicks, the tears, the scalps, and the yelps. And the poor old lousy old earth, and this poor old lousy old earth, <coughs> my earth, and my father's and my mother's, and my father's fathers and my mother's mothers, and my father's mothers and my mother's fathers, and my father's mother's fathers, and my mother's father's mothers, and my father's mother's mothers, and my mother's father's fathers, and my father's father's mothers, and my mother's mother's fathers, and my father's father's fathers and my mother's mother's mothers, and other people's fathers and mothers, <laughs> and father's fathers and mother's mothers, and father's mothers and mother's fathers, and father's mother's fathers, and mother's father's mothers, and father's mother's mothers, and mother's father's fathers, and father's father's mothers, and mother's mother's fathers, and father's father's fathers, and mother's mother's mothers, <coughs> and excrements. The crocuses, and the larch turning green every year, a week before the others, and the pastures red with unbeat, uneaten sheep's placenta, and the long summer days, and the new mown hay, and the wood pigeon in the morning, and the cuckoo in the afternoon, and the corn crake in the evening, and the wasps in the jam, and the smell of the gorse, and the look of the gorse, and the apples falling, and the children walking, and the dead leaves, and the larch turning brown a week before the others, and the chestnuts falling, and the howling winds, and the sea breaking over the pier, and the first fires, and the hooves on the road, and the consumptive postman whistling, the roses are blooming in Picardy, and the standard oil lamp, and of course, the snow, and to be, and to be sure, the sleet, and bless your heart, the slush, and every fourth year, the February debacle, and the endless April showers, and the crocuses, and then the whole bloody business starting all over again. A turd. And if I could begin it all over again, knowing what I know now, the result would be the same. And if I could begin again a third time, knowing what I would know then, the result would be the same. And if I could begin it all over again a hundred times, knowing each time a little more than the time before, the result would always be the same. And a hundredth life as the first, and the hundred lives as one. A cat's flux. But at this rate, we'll sh we shall be here all night. Well, it goes on for another 20 pages. Yeah. 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 
That, that reading reminds us all of something very, very important about Beckett. What an amazing composer he was. Yes. Amazing composer. Oh, true. God, it's extraordinary. Just listening to his prose, it stops being prose. It, it, yeah. it, it becomes music. It doesn't become. It doesn't become poetry. It becomes music. It, it, it retains its, 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 its sense, but it becomes music. It is true of all the fine writers, I think. Yes, yeah. each, each great writer has his own music, but Beckett has a particular purity to it yes, that, it that um, really burns, burns through in ways that... It doesn't hurt being Irish, of course. Uh, perhaps not, but there are a lot of lousy Irish writers, too. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> the music was very important to Beckett. He played the piano, and, and yes. the, the only instruments he actually brought to, you see, this absurd little house he had, uh, was a, a straight piano, uh, up straight, upright, 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 upright. sorry. Um, you know that house, he built it and then he was in the living room and he saw people looking into him and he started crawling he, for the rest of the stay until he got a gardener or an architect to build a wall. Put a wall around the house, yeah, absolutely. right? Absolutely. <laughs> um, well, there's a story I wanted to tell about my first meeting with Beckett. I remember yesterday I said I wanted to talk about this um, as the cops are chasing the robbers, huh? Yeah. yeah. This is New York. Anyway, um, I, I became, I, I lived in France in the early 70s and I, I became good friends with Joan Mitchell, the American painter who lived there. And Joan had been married to Barney Rossett, the, the publisher of Grove Press, and, and was a very good friend of Beckett's. And one day we were talking about Beckett's work, and she said, would you like to meet him? And I said, yeah, of course I would like to meet him. And she said, well, just write him a letter and say I said so. So I wrote him a letter and said, Joan Mitchell suggest. And he, he wrote back two or three days later and said, you know, meet me at the Closerie de Lila and we'll, we'll have a drink together. So I went, I was absolutely trembling in my boots. I don't think I've ever been more nervous about meeting a human being in my life. To me, he was the exalted god of literature. And uh, really, if I had been going to meet Winston Churchill, I would not have been as I, intimidated. I, yeah. um, but it turned out he was very nice, direct, gentle, funny, um, engaging. Um, and at one point he mentioned that he was translating into English the first novel he had written in French, Mercier and Camier. And um, he had won the Nobel Prize a couple of years before. And his French publisher wanted to get um, as much of his work published as possible. So after writing the book in 46, he, Beckett finally allowed it to be published in 1970. And now he was doing the English version. And he said to me, you know, it's really not a very good book. <laughs> and uh, I've been going through it and I've cut out about 25% of the original French for the translation into English. And I said, um, why? I had read it in French. I said, why would you do it, that? It's such a great book. He said, no, no, it's really not very good. It's not very good at all. And I said, well, you know, I was young and innocent and optimistic about life. I said, no, no, it's really a, a wonderful book. I, I disagree with you. And then we went on to talk about other things. And um, about 10 minutes later, you know, apropos of nothing, he just interrupted. He said, uh, you really liked it, huh? <laughs> you, you really think it's good? And I said, yeah, I really think it's good. And to me, this was the revelation about every artist not understanding the value of his own work. Of course. Um, and it stayed with me. And, uh, and, I, and I know just how he feels or how he felt yeah. now as I am approaching the age he was then. It's amazing to think about it. Um, but there he was, the greatest writer living in the world at the time, and he had not a clue about not a how clue. good it was. I agree. We, we, we had seen Godot when it was first 
produced in Paris at the Théâtre Babylone. I was, Dick was, and I were dating at that point, and we went to see it, and there were 14 people in the theater, and very mixed reviews. Well, 10 years later, he'd had the Nobel, and the same production with the same cast was put on at the Théâtre National de l'Odéon, big time. Very formal gala opening, and he refused to go. We were supposed to have dinner with him, and he said, I'll just meet you afterwards. So we went, and it was a standing ovation. The same reviewers who had put him down 10 years before were now singing his praise. So we arrive at the dome where he was waiting, and he, his head was in his hands, and he was in total depression. And I said, Sam, this was a wonderful, wonderful production. It was great. And he says, you don't know what you're talking about. It's a terrible play. It's, a ter it's rubbish, he said. <laughs> Godot. It's not bad. <laughs> So it continued. He never thought it was a good play. He was really yeah. uh, in deep depression, really, most of his life about his work. I know. Well, um, I don't know if anyone's been reading the uh, letters of Beckett that have been coming out now. There are two yeah. volumes out of four. And I've, I've gone through these two volumes, each as came out. And in the second volume, just as he's beginning to um, uh, acquire some some traction in the world of literature had become read and even well known um, he's, he's writing to friends all the time saying you have no idea how deeply I despise my own work and it's very sincere yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, Edward uh, I just want to know when did you first encounter Beckett uh, that was my original and, question and the, and thank you for yeah. asking it again let me answer it a different way when did I meet Beckett no when did, when did oh sorry yeah. it's, uh, the same, it's the same thing you're right. I met Beckett and encountered Beckett at exactly the moment, the moment I read my first sentence by Beckett. Uh, but when was that? Do you remember? When I first read him. <laughs> yes. Uh, we don't have a date. Uh, you see, I, I, I don't think you need to meet people in person to know them or to meet them. I don't think that's necessary. No, I know, but I just I want to know when it happened. How, how old were you? <laughs> I just am curious. Since I can't remember anything specifically. <laughs> was that before Zoo Story? I, I know, of course, everything was before the Zoo Story. Um, I, I know that uh, I, I, I met Beckett the first time I experienced his work. I, it was a meeting of Beckett. Now, that's the only way I can describe it. I met the guy then. You know, I understand, but was it a play? Was it a, a, a work of fiction? You don't remember. No. Plays are also works of fiction. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay. All right. We're going to go around and around tonight, I can see. <laughs> We're sounding more and more like two characters out of yes. what? Yes, 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 yes we are. Yeah. I was told, and I'm not sure it's correct, that there was a bus driver in Roussillon whose name was Godot, and indeed there were always a cluster of people waiting for the damn bus that never seemed to arrive, en attendant Godot. It seems as plausible an explanation as any other. It's just a little aside yeah. to diversion. Well, gentlemen? If uh, Edward refuses to answer, I'm not, maybe, I'm not refusing, maybe I don't understand the maybe question. Maybe the question could be turned to you. When, when, did, did you, when you started writing, did you, you were very under the influence of Beckett, perhaps, were you? Well, yes, I, I, you know, I was, again, I was very young, I was So it all is forgiven. Well, I don't know if it's all is forgiven, but um, I, I couldn't really see my way around him. As, as Edward says in his introduction, in a way, he, he, he puts up a, a blockage. Uh, it's hard to see mm -hmm. the way around him. And when I was very young, I couldn't. And I, I therefore really stuck to just writing poetry. I thought there was no way I could contribute anything to the novel, even though that's what I was dying to do. And it took me a while to, um, uh, what, to grow up? to feel a certain indifference. You used the word yesterday. You said purge yourself of it. Purge it, purge, maybe. I think it was more saying, well, you know, Beckett, 
you know, that's enough, you know, I don't need you anymore, I'm, I'm throwing off my back, you know, I, 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 I love your work, but I've got to do my own stuff. Sure. Yeah. And, um, and, and then, then it became possible for me to write. Sure. Because fiction. it would be easier than trying to do something that good? Well, you always want to do it the best you can, but you know, as you say, very beautifully in your little piece, you can't imitate. I mean, imitation is just a ridiculous exercise in stupidity, yeah. So, um, it took a while. But you know, Pinter's first play, The Caretaker, was very, very much under the influence of Beckett. Very not, much not, so. not a bad choice. Not a bad yeah. choice, but very much so. He, he again grew into finding his own voice. Yes, yes. But, uh, uh, and the amazing thing... Well, so, so did Beckett find its own voice. Indeed. After, yes. after his first few plays. Yeah. But it's true. But you see, I think in fiction, I think after the great period of the three novels you mentioned, and then there's, a, that, there's some stories that are fantastic that you, you mentioned, Jeanette, and then Text for Nothing is one of the great works that Beckett wrote. After that, I'm not as crazy about the fiction. Um, I think uh, How It Is is a you know, tremendously great book, but it, it's drier than... Very than, than Very and, much and, so. and he went through a long... Just, li just listen to it. No, it's beautiful. If, if, if you listen to Beckett, you get so much more out of it than, so than, than, than simply reading it. Yeah. That is yeah. true. Mm. You're right. But I see, I think later on, there were some late works. Company, for example. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a very, one of the best things he'd ever written. And he was, oh, I guess deep into his 70s by then. Yeah. And he found some, some less rigid way of expressing himself Possibly. again. Possibly, yes. Um, uh, but I think the plays just got better and better all the time. Um, they're, they're remarkable. Uh, they are. You mentioned Ohio Impromptu. Um, it's, it's what, five pages, six pages? But it, it's so beautiful and um, um, really wrenchingly beautiful, in fact. And, uh, you know, and it's hard to see these works. Um, but if anyone has the interest, I would recommend, even though it's flawed, uh, the Gate Theatre in, in Dublin uh, recorded uh, about 19 or 20 Beckett yeah. plays on film. And some of the productions are better than others. But at least it gives you a chance to see some of the plays that you just don't get to see on, on stage. Can you get those uh, CDs? I, someone gave it to me years ago uh -huh. as a present from England DVDs or to Ireland. And um, uh, I remember the Ohio Impromptu had Jeremy Irons in it. Oh, yes. Yeah, it was really quite a, quite a good, good production. Okay. Yeah. Well, is it time for question and answers? Yes, Chief. Sorry. What do you want? Well, she needs a mic. Oh, and you too share. So we're going to take um, five brief questions from the audience. Five. Three hundred and seventy-five. So, um, who has questions? Here, I'm going to. Hi, um, my name is Christina. Thank you guys very much for this talk. It was really great. Um, I have a question for Mr. Albee. Sorry, am I saying your name right? <laughs> um, so, in the later editions of Martin Eslin's work on the theater of the absurd, the, of what? the later editions of Martin Eslin's work um, on the theater of the absurd, he, kind, he identifies you as a protege of this movement that is, encompasses Beckett, but Ionesco and um, Adamov and Genet as well. And I was wondering... You mean the Theater of the Absurd. Theater of the Absurd, Martin Esslin. <laughs> that, that, that preposterous this, this <laughs> bit of misinformation. Yeah, I mean, it's since been kind of torn apart, but I was wondering to what extent do you agree with that assessment of you as a protege or a inheritor of this tradition of the absurd? Well, since I don't really know whether I, I, I began thinking in those terms, I don't know how to answer whether I continued feeling that way. I, I don't really understand most of, most of these terms that uh, critics use to define, to define things. 
I can only judge by what I respond to and believe. That's all I can respond to. And, and, and I don't think much about, um, well, for example, um, the concept of the theater of the absurd. About the simplification of that is uh, the definition of something that makes absolutely no sense, and we have to believe the fact that, that something makes absolutely no sense. This puzzles me when it, when, whenever I hear anything like that, because I don't know what that gibberish means half the time. I, I don't know much of what most people think that they're talking about when they talk about literature. I think they would merely experience it and, and not have to come to conclusions about it. Any other questions? Uh, this is for uh, Albie as well. You spoke earlier of um, Beckett and Pinter finding their own voice. When did you, um, this actually applies to both of you, when did you, each of you um, find your own personal voice after getting around the I blockade. Think, well, I that think one of the things that allowed me to begin to find the individuality of my voice was being able to hear it, to listen to it, to respond to it, to what it was saying and the way it was saying it. Um, I've always thought that I was, when I was a kid, I thought I was going to be a, a composer. I had absolutely no talent as, as a composer. My concept of a string quartet wouldn't pass muster anywhere. Though I loved classical music, and I still do, probably more than any other art form. Painting and sculpture being a close second, even more than literature. Because I find all three of them relate to each other in ways that they cannot exist without each other. But um, how did I get started on that? Yeah. Where was I going? Oh, it, it, where you find uh, inspiration, right? Inspiration from the greats, but I, I'm a fool, so I try to imitate. I don't know how to get it I guess I haven't found my voice. I guess they're both asking, you're asking both of them about influence, right? Who influenced no. them or where they find their voice? Their influence and made for them. Right? Where are you? I find that all of the arts relate to each other profoundly and, and you can't have one of them without relating to the others. And composers are writers and writers are, are, are composers and, and, and sculptors of this or that. It, it, it is all the same thing. It is a different manifestation of the same thing. I guess the question, how did you make it your own, all these influences? How did you make it into your own voice as a writer? Well, he, he was only asking right. Edward the question. No, I think so. you as well. Oh, me too. Yeah. Um, I, I, well, I don't know. I, I agree with what Edward is saying, that I don't understand the labels that critics and journalists give. They're uh, there to do stuff like you're, that. You're, you're, you're the absurd uh, theater man. I'm the postmodernist novelist. <laughs> I have no idea what postmodernism is, <laughs> and I never once thought. I'm of glad any you. Of I'm this. glad you don't know. And um, <laughs> you know, you quoted Jacques Derrida before. A writer I have never read because I found him impossible to understand. And again and again, you know, students have written whole papers, even books about Derrida's influence on my writing. Have you read? Have you <laughs> <laughs> really? And um, so I am as befuddled as Edward. I just do what I do. And as you say, you listen to that voice. And if you can hear it, it starts to sing inside you. And that's. Well, then you don't. Then you crumple up that page. Uh, but I'm saying, if it's working, it's working, and you know when it's working, and you know when it's not working. But I think, in my own case, um, since I was such a uh, literary boy, um, and I read so many books, and I was carrying literature on my back for years, and then I, I hit a kind of crisis when I was in my late twenties, maybe thirty. And I stopped writing for a whole year. It just didn't do anything. 
And then um, when I was ready to write again, I didn't care anymore. Those books were not on my back. And I said, I'm just doing what I'm doing. I can hear it. I can hear the voice. And I'm just going to listen to this voice for the rest of my life. And it's been going that way now for decades. We, don't, we, do, we never hear our own voices. We hear the voices that we have invented. Okay, that's a more precise way of putting it. Whatever it is that's in your head, yeah. you hear it. And I don't know where it comes from. It probably comes from many different places all at once. It's because we're composers. It's music, but it is music. And everything I've ever written, every novel, forget poems, but every novel begins with a buzz in my head and there's a rhythm. And the rhythm comes before the words. I'm just trying to follow that music as I'm writing the book. Any more questions? Okay. Do all three of you agree that the, you prefer the prose and plays to the poetry? And if so, what is present in the plays and the prose that is not present in the poetry? I'm not even sure that Beck could thought in those terms. Does he think of himself as a novelist or, or, or a playwright? I, I don't think that if, if you were really to get him to be honest, he, he probably would have said, you know, I think maybe the poems aren't quite as good as the other stuff. He might, he might have felt that he way. He might have felt that, yes. I wouldn't be surprised. But he, hell, hell, he didn't need to have done the poetry, too. It's not bad. It's pretty good poetry. But I, I think he, his accomplishments in letting us understand the nature of the communication of the arts is so much higher uh, in the prose than in the drama. Well, I agree, but I have a soft spot for the poetry. I think there's some, there are two or three really beautiful poems, and then there's some really good lines in the others. And mm -hmm. he only wrote no about, question. only about 30, 30 poems. There's a very tiny output of poetry. It's really nice. And maybe if he had only done that, it would have become extraordinary. But I think his gifts lay in other places, and, that, and he went there. And why, why, why are you complaining about Beckett? Yeah. I'm not complaining. I'm just giving him. I think he's a wonderful poet, but he's better at the other things. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, hello. Uh, um, Where I, are you? What? Who's talking? Me. Moi. Her. I'm oh. right here. See, I was looking okay. out. Okay. Um, I recently uh, started working I, at the Actors Studio on a play of Beckett's uh, Come and Go, which has 149 words in it. Well, the, the fascinating thing to me about that uh, was the, to follow his directions to the nth degree, which is uh, most actors, including myself, oh, it's going to strangle me, I can't do this, blah, 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 was the most liberating thing I've ever done in my life. And, and it, you fill those blank, supposed blank spots you don't know what you're filling it with. He's filling it while, while you're just following his directions. It was astonishing. I mean, have you, have you ever seen those plays? Uh, have you? No. Uh, come and go, a catastrophe. Again, uh, fall, I've, only seen it, I've only seen it in that, on that DVD okay. from the Gate Theater. And okay. it's a wonderful uh, rendition of that play. The costumes oh, are great. The women move perfectly. It's, a, it's like a dance. Yeah, no, yeah. incredible. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, we got incredible re responses from it. And we're probably going to be doing it in a theater soon, okay. uh, along with some other stuff. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. Two more questions. Yes. Uh, what are your own uh, individual interpretations of Waiting for Gatto? <laughs> of what? Of what? Waiting for, Waiting for Gatto. With any luck, it's the same as Beckett's. <laughs> Uh, I really can't disagree Why with you. Would you be interested in, in, in any of our interpretations? Uh, uh, it's, all, it's, it's, it's all there. It's all there, and it's, it's all there in his own piece. Hang on. You can't, it's all there. You can't understand Gudu. No, I just. I don't, there's something there, and I just don't know what it is. Oh my, oh my God. There's something there. Oh my God. Do you know? When Dick was dating me, he 
in his passion for Beckett, he took me to Théâtre Babylone, and I was a kid. And I suppose he told me later it was a test. Had I failed, I would not have married him, or he would not have married me, rather. And I got it. There's nothing not to get. What's the, I've got to talk to you. This, <laughs> this is impossible. It is so simple. So simple. So, so simple. Clear, so profound. So, so inevitable. Y yeah. Yes. You, can have, you can have any kind of I private interpretation. It fits. It's okay. It's very, very human, very funny. It's hilarious. A sense of humor is something we didn't talk about. He has an enormous sense of humor. Yeah, but that, well, he was being, yeah, okay. We all lie when we say we don't understand yeah. what we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> we, the difference is we don't always want to take responsibility for it. I think one more question and then we will end this. I would like to ask about the, um, about the creative process that you were speaking, that you have uh, to listen to your own uh, voice. And if you think that after having a crisis or not writing for a while, or uh, if, you, if you can again hear that and you know, doing something like um, believing in your own job, what did she say? She said that um, when you've had a crisis and you stop writing for a period of time, can you believe in your voice Start again? Start again. I think uh, this is my interpretation of the question. Uh, if you stop writing, you've been writing, and you stop you for, want? you stop, stop writing because there's been a crisis, like the year or whatever may happen, and you stop writing, and then you begin to write again, how do you believe in that new voice again? How do you s sort of write again and believe in yourself after you've stopped? Why would you stop? <laughs> or, 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 or if you stop, what does it matter for a while? Well, I guess you have writer's block. Isn't that what they no, call it? Writer's block is, 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 is gibberish. <laughs> you lose your house. <laughs> What do you think? You stopped uh, for a year. Yeah, uh, it wasn't writer's block. It was uh, 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 a, a crisis, a philosophical, psychological, spiritual crisis. Writing was part of it. Which you're best gotten rid of. Yeah, well, you have to live through certain tough, tough patches, and I did. When I started writing again, I don't know, I, it felt inevitable. And because it felt inevitable, I, I followed it. Um, I didn't question it anymore. I, I just, listen, of course you question it. I mean, word by word, sentence by sentence, page by page. But the overall impulse to do it, I didn't question. That's what I'm saying. All right. Um, but you know, you can't listen to us for advice. <laughs> what, you, you know, you just have to find your own way. Uh, when young people come to me and say they want to be writers, I say, don't do it. Don't do it. Um, because what you're getting yourself don't into it, do it. is a life of loneliness, poverty, and neglect. I mean, that's pretty much what you're, you're asking for. Now, if, and if you're if, bad enough, you'll make a lot of money. Yeah, yeah, well, if anyone listens to my advice, then that person's not meant to be a writer. Um, and if they don't listen to it, and they go ahead and do it, then they have to figure it out for themselves. Thank you all so much. Thank you.